Hey, what's up everybody? It is Kellen here from Start Your Systems and welcome back to MX vs ATV All Out where today we are continuing on with some more uh, AMA Pro Motocross Pro Nationals gameplay uh, videos here. We're doing Unadilla today, which is actually released today for anybody that uh, wants to go pick it up wherever uh, it is going to be downloaded to your files from. Whether you're on Xbox or PlayStation or the PC, uh, it should just like kind of auto download for you today. Um, and uh, yeah, go ahead and try it out. If you got that season pass, that $14.99 season pass to get the remainder of the outdoors, this is what's next. This is Unadilla. Um, we had the off week going for Loretta's. I did not do a video on the Loretta Lynn's track, but that is also available in the game if you want to try that out. And now we are playing Unadilla, and this is awesome rendition just like Washuga was that I played a couple weeks ago uh, of this racetrack I have been to this racetrack in real life before as well so I kind of get a little bit better the sense for like elevation change on the racetrack I kind of know that I guess a little bit better than if I don't, haven't been to the track and I feel like they, they got this one pretty spot on I think some areas it's lacking a little bit more of the like depth of elevation um, and it almost appears that some sections they kind of either elongated the jumps or toned down a little bit based on like kind of the physical engine of the game so you don't necessarily launch as far or whatever in some spots um, but overall I mean I just think that this is just a, a really good solid complete Unadilla uh, I've quite enjoyed putting in a little bit of time in it already and uh, hopefully you guys will as well what I'm going to do today is instead of just like playing this track, talking about the track itself, because honestly I'm not like the best at explaining how I feel in MX Day TV All Out, because I'm not very good at it as you may have already guessed. Um, so I'm going to break this video down into some real life discussion, which I kind of do on this channel anyway. If you've never been here before, first of all, welcome, um, but second of all, what I kind of like to do is weekly updates of like real life racing but play a video game at the same time so it's almost like you're listening into like a short little podcast and watching some gameplay of whatever game that it is uh, it doesn't always have to be a specific game sometimes it's sim sometimes it's uh, you know MXGP sometimes it's this game um, or in the past sometimes it was Supercross Encore whatever it is usually just sit down, talk for like 10-15 minutes about the racing action that's been going on and either get you caught up or maybe talk about some things that you didn't know and always like opening up into this, the discussions below in the comments uh, to hear your guys' thoughts and opinions. Uh, but yeah, this track, Unadilla, like I said, try it out. You know, all the goods, the gravity cavity, the sky shot, the screw you or the elevator shaft depending on how PC you are. All built so well into one really nice Unadilla. Try it out. And let's talk about some real life racing. All right, Washougal is coming gone. That was a week ago or a week and a half ago, depending on how uh, what time you're watching this video. And uh, we had Dylan Ferrandis winning and uh, Eli Tomac dominating. I would say that Ferrandis probably, you could say he dominated the first moto, but he did fall back into the clutches of everybody late in that one. And then the second moto, he had Cian Cerullo all over his hind quarters the entire race. So I wouldn't say Frandis dominated, but I would say Eli Tomac dominated Washugal. He started outside of the top 10, basically both motos. He started outside of the top 15. The second moto, he came from pretty far back and rocketed through everybody. And, you know, give credit where credit's due. When he caught Roxon in the first moto, Roxon picked up the pace just a little bit and was able to somewhat respond to the pressure early on. Um, and then Tomac crashed and then got back up and went full beast mode, caught and passed him. And then in the second moto, he uh, Tomac caught up to Marvin, and Marvin gave him a good fight for three, four laps, and then Tomac was out of there. I mean, this is this is like kind of the quintessential Eli Tomac. Everybody loves to see uh, him do this because it always makes the race kind of more exciting. Um, I will say that like this is this is going to be one of those like outlier moments for him though, where when he is having that weirdo seventh place in Florida, you're like. What? Like, how is it that he can go to Washougal and walk through everybody from 30 seconds behind and win by 15 seconds, but he's getting walloped on by Freddie Noren on a stock Honda at WW Ranch? So, like, that's when, you know, we criticize Tomac as a collective group. 
that you can kind of draw on some comparisons and be like, how is one week he's this good and how is another week he's not this good? But he was very good at Washougal and looks like he's quite well on his way to his third consecutive outdoor title, which puts him obviously in rare air. Um, only Carmichael and I believe Gary Jones have ever actually done that um, before, so that's kind of crazy. And he also is now fifth all time on the outdoor 450 motocross win the list. Uh, he's not fifth all time overall because James Stewart's 125 records have carried him above and beyond a lot of people. And uh, so he's still behind like Carmichael, Dungey, Stu, Rick Johnson, Bob Hanna, and maybe one other that I'm not thinking of. But um, yeah, fifth all time premier class 450 outdoor national wins. He is one behind Rick Johnson now, I think. Or no, maybe he's one behind Bob Hanna and uh, six behind Rick Johnson. And he is 18 behind Ryan Dungey and quick math, quick math. Let me think 50, 55 behind Carmichael. <laughs> it's kind of crazy to think about. Um, Carmichael did some amazing stuff when he was racing, I'll admit that. Uh, but yeah, Tomac just on his way to a three-peat, I think. And uh, unfortunately, kind of kind of have to talk about this for a, a good little bit of the video here because it's going to be brought up this week as well. Uh, it sounds like we're not going to hear to or see Tomac or Adam Cianstrullo at the Motocross of Nations this year at Assen in the Netherlands. And their excuse thus far, or I should say Cianzulo's excuse thus far, as he was, uh, as he alluded to on the Pulp Mech show a week ago, was Kawasaki told him no. So he said, yes, I'd like to go. I don't know if Roger DeCoster asked or whatever, but uh, Cianzulo was fully on board and Kawasaki said no. Now that's what he is saying. What he's saying in the truth could be very different things. Cian Cerlo is usually quite truthful, so I tend to believe him in this one. But he also could just maybe not want to go and just wants a scapegoat. And Kawasaki says, all right, well, you know, we want you healthy for your rookie 450 season. Why don't you just use us as a scapegoat, come into Monster Cup, test out the 450 the first time and not feel like you're pressured onto the bike or anything like that. Like, take the time that's necessary to get used to a 450, etc., etc." Whichever way you swing it, I think it's kind of just a, a big old pile of garbage, either direction. Kawasaki telling someone who is, you know, a, a, a diehard American motocross kiddo uh, and is going to maybe get the chance to live out a dream and race motocross the nations and then telling him no is BS to me. And seeing Cerullo, you know, being probably the best 250 rider at least in America, if not the world, it depends on what you want to say about Prado. I don't think Cien is going to beat Prado in the sand, but, you know, maybe other races or tracks he may. Um, but Cien is one of the best riders in the world right now on a 250 and won't be there. And it, 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 you know, if it's from Cowie, that sucks. But if it's from him, that's kind of lame. Like, I don't know. Like, I like the kid and, and I hate to, like, call him on his bluff here, but if he is you know, actually using a cop out here, that's a little crappy to me. What I'm leading into all this though, is that if Kawasaki did actually tell Cien Strulo no, they're also gonna tell Eli Tomac no. Like I'm, uh, th we've been hearing this for months. It's been speculated for months. Every podcast I listen to has been saying this for months. It sounds like Eli Tomac is either going to decline or Kawasaki is going to pull him away from the opportunity to race for the United States at Assen this year. And at this point, I'm just, I, I'm just, I can't be on board with it anymore. I, I've tried to, you know, a lot, you know, be okay with Tomax, you know, bowing out two years ago and not going to Madeley Basin. And um, it, it, it just, you know, like he's the best rider in the USA right now. It's one of the best riders in the world. Yeah, maybe right now he could be the best rider in the world because Tim Geyser is, you know, the only guy out there that's healthy. Cairoli and Hurlings are hurt. But it sucks that we're going to go to this Motocross the Nations this year and not all the best guys are going to be lining up. And I just... It's my favorite race of the year. And to have this situation where we're going to be missing such powerhouse guys in Tomac and Cien 
really sucks. So the team that it sounds like USA is going to go with is um, Jason Anderson will be the MX1 rider. Zach Osborne will be the MX Open rider, and uh, Justin Cooper will be the MX2 rider because there's three riders that go for your nation uh, in three different classes. The Open class used to kind of be like where 450 slash 500s would go. Like there used to be a 250, two stroke, 500, and uh, 125 class, but then obviously when two strokes went away and it went to 450, 250F, then they made it an open class. And I think even for a little bit, they were allowing like 520s and 540s to race those uh, old KTMs. But now it's limited to 450 uh, max, but you can ride a 250F if you want in the open class, but you know, you can't ride a 250 in the MX1 class and you can't ride a 450 in the MX2 class. So they leave it open for whoever wants to fill that slot. In this case, we always usually put a 450 guy in that spot. And we never, as a country in the United States, uh, think outside the box and put a 450 rider back down onto a 250, which they definitely could do in this case. They could very easily tell Osborne to ride a Husky 250 or Cooper Webb to ride a KTM 250. And I'm kind of bummed that they're not going to do that because I like Justin Cooper. I think he's a great rider. He's a great starter, so that's going to help. But I really think it would have been better to send someone that's maybe a little bit more like experience with the motocross of nations to Assen just because it's going to be really hard for team USA to compete this year. So to send, to send a complete rookie and a guy that's probably not going to win the outdoor title this year anyway, I think is a little, a little much to put on his shoulders. Is, is he going to probably be okay? Yeah, but I would have actually preferred to have seen you know, Osborne 250, Webb and Anderson 450 for the team. Doesn't sound like it's going to be that way, but I'm happy regardless with the team that's going because if you're going to eliminate Tomac and uh, Cian Cerullo, then you start getting into a muddy water situation where, you know, a couple years ago, a lot of guys didn't go. Dungey had retired. Tomac elected not to go. Um, I think Cooper Webb also said he wasn't going either, or something like that. I forget how it was all turning out. Um, but we, you know, ended up sending Seely Osborne and Thomas Covington rode a 450, and like that was just like basically a C team at that point because so many guys were backing out, thinking there wasn't a legitimate chance for the USA to win the Motocross of Nations. So we ended up just sending a team of guys that really wanted to go instead of guys that probably could have helped us win. No offense, but I don't think Cole Seeley is necessarily a guy you anchor your team on when you're going to face some of the best riders in the world, um, which is a little sad to say because now Cole Seeley just retired this past week. Uh, great career for him, but uh, you know I think it's going to be a little bit of a, a disappointment for him looking back that he couldn't, you know, stay healthy longer and you know click off a couple more wins when he probably could have I think over his career. Regardless. Divulging away from that a little bit, continuing with the donations talk. Um, like I said, happy with Team USA. I don't think they're going to win. I still have Netherlands pegged as the, the winners. Uh, it's pretty likely that Koldenhoff, Landron, and Hurlings will go. Koldenhoff and Hurlings should go 1-2-2-1 one, two, two, one, uh, if Cairoli isn't there. In my opinion, I think he won't be because he's you know still nursing shoulder surgery. Doesn't sound like Alessandro Lupino is going to be ready to go either. <clears throat> so Italy might be sending a B team, which means Cairoli probably will just be like, I'm, I'm not going to go and risk it if I'm going to not have an A team around me. So I think Netherlands can probably win it. I think France could maybe go for the six Pete. They'll probably have Fevre Paulin and, you know, Tom Vial or something like that. Marvin Muscan has already said he declined, which I don't blame him uh, because, you know, the French Federation, you know, bent him over last year, for lack of a better word. And, uh, yeah, I, I think that Marvin Muscan for the rest of his career is allowed to say F you to the French Federation for how much they screwed him last year. Um, would I have liked to see him race? Yep, absolutely. But, honestly, he may not even be their best choice. I think that Paul N, who's won at Vulcan Sward before on a 450, and Fevre, who is clearly one of the best riders in the GP circuit right now, uh, should be the choices on a 450. Now, you could argue that you could put one of them back on a 250, like I said with Webb, but um, Marvin hasn't ridden a 250 for three, four years already now since 2015. 
and I think you're getting to the point where you gotta, you know, call upon the next generation, I guess, on a 250, and that's that's gonna be Tom Vial. So it sounds like that'll be the team for France. Not announced yet, but we'll see. And uh, as obviously we get closer to race time, which is still like a month and a half away, but teams are gonna start getting announced here really quick. Uh, the USA team will be announced in Adila as they always are. And as we get closer to race time, I'm gonna be doing a lot more discussions about it because it's my personal favorite race of the year. And uh, as always, looking forward to seeing that race happen. As for Unadilla this weekend, just to kind of wrap up this video a little bit, I am going to say that this weekend is going to be won by Dylan Ferrandis. This is a very European-style racetrack. Ferrandis has done well here in the past. I think he's going to carry his momentum from Washougal. Go 1-1 this weekend. And I think Marvin Muskan is going to go 3-1 and win the overall. Eli Tomac is going to go 2-3. Uh, and I think Roxon will win the first moto, but then finish like fourth or something the second moto. So I think Marvin's going to win the overall uh, this weekend. I think France is going to win the overall in the 250 class. So it's a French invasion, perhaps a Unadilla, but maybe I don't know. Maybe Eli Tomac lights up the the timesheets again, makes things really interesting, uh, starting from deeper in the field and coming through. And uh, hopefully everybody enjoys watching a lovely Unadilla this weekend. But this is my little brief synopsis of the track in MXRZ TV All Out and a little bit of discussion about some real life moto. Hope you guys enjoyed. As always, I'll see you guys down in the comment section below if you have anything you want to discuss. And uh, Kellen here from Start Your System saying thanks for watching and I'll see you guys in the next one. So long for now.